Yes, let's talk about the defensive issues. This is a very important topic for all Chelsea fans out there, up and down the country, all around the world. I keep hearing people in the comments, on Twitter, on YouTube. Everyone's asking me what's going on with our defence. So I thought, mate, I'd, I'd ask for your help because I need some help, right? I've got some stats for you. These stats are absolutely mental. 52 goals conceded in 30 games this season in total. We've had seven games in a row where we've conceded more than two goals. That's including teams like Sheffield, Burnley, Leicester, Leeds, it doesn't sound good, does it? And then I looked at the stats in the past, and I've tried to compare that to this season. Since 1990, we haven't had a worse season like this. And in 1990, it was 69 goals conceded in 38 matches. It just isn't good enough, mate, is it? Do you know what I mean? Terrible. So, yeah, yeah. So I thought what we could do is we could go in and actually sort of like analyse the tactics. So I think the first portal call is, can you do me a favour, just very quickly summarise how you see it, like Poch's tactical system, this year because then we can analyze it basically yeah so i'd basically say we're looking to play high intensity always speeding up the play football so a lot of what you'll see is on the front foot he wants to get the ball back and as soon as we win the ball back the the onus is not to slow it down and control but it is to actually use that and go quick so high intensity and really quickly going from defense to attack so you'll very rarely see the ball staying in that middle of the pitch unless we're against a low box side who are purposely trying to make us do that so a lot of these games, you will end up seeing this basketball theme where it is very end to end. And you, he almost wants you to engage in that, which is why he's also so insistent about the running power of players and saying we didn't run enough against Burnley, for example. He wants us to outrun teams. He wants to create chaos. I know people don't like the the idea or the notion that Poch is trying to create chaos, but he is. That is, he's not a slow tempo manager. He wants things to be quick and he wants his players to be able to almost run other players, other teams off the park. So that is essentially in a nutshell that's what you're looking at yeah would you would you describe i've always found this quite difficult with posh would you describe it as a 4-2-3-1 or is it a 4-3-3 in your head i, I would say a 4-2-3-1 but yeah. it, can, it can obviously look like a 4-3-3 at times i think we've kind of done both this year and i think he did both at psg as well so i would say his more more common is 4-2-3-1 but i think you could you can see iterations of both Yes. So that gets on to my first point. I think we have to discuss this, right? Because it's not always just about the defence, is it, with these things? So I thought, why don't we start further up the pitch? And let's talk mm -hmm. about the midfield. Obviously, we look at Conor Gallagher and his role this season has basically been what? Like a pressing 10, I would sort of say, like a pressing 8 slash 10, right? And we tend to see in the sort of the, the pressing play a 4-2-4, basically, right, where Gallagher will push right up. And then basically you're leaving Enzo and Caicedo in the middle of the pitch. And they, I mean, Caicedo can definitely cover ground, but I would probably say his best role is in a sort of a halfway between a six and an eight. And then what, I, I don't know if you find this as well, mate, but what I'm finding with Enzo, because he's not the most paceful, you know, pacey guy, he tends to sort of be isolated. And so it's often Enzo by himself. What, what do you think generally about the sort of the midfield and how this is affecting our defence at the moment? Because it doesn't seem that good, does it? No. And I, again, I think this is a lot to do with the gaps that emerge through us trying to always play so quickly. And like we say, you know, Gallagher is, is actually kind of made for this football. So this is why he's looked so good this season. This is his sort of team. Like This is where he should be playing. So going up and down and he's like looking to put pressure in the attacking third. But then behind that, you've got Casado, as you say, can cover ground, but he's not always looking to sit as that prime, as that lone six. Enzo, he's being told to go box to box, but as you say, he's not the most, most athletic. So that's not in his skill set. Even though he has such a big skill set, that's not one of them. So you've, you're almost leaving massive gaps. And then also, we'll speak about the defence after, but I'll just stick to the midfield. So the midfielders then, you have that big gap between Casado, Enzo, and then Gallagher, who's stretched it because he can get back and forth. But then a lot of the time what you'll see as well is with Enzo and Casado, they're both told to jump up. They're not, so Casado doesn't always sit in behind, whereas you've got like a Rice for Arsenal who will always sort of just sit in the position to almost screen the defence and find the ball. But with both of our defensive mids, they both want to push and I don't know if that's a potch thing or if that's on them or it's interesting to see but I think with the way we play right now a lot of the time they'll both step up and then they can almost get isolated so if they then a switch goes over to the other side of the pitch they're both out of position and it's basically they're into our back four and it almost looks like the midfield's just been completely bypassed which is another thing that a lot of people say.
Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it, mate? I was looking at the stats of this. Like, I think of Chelsea pretty much as a high-pressing team, and, and I feel that that is relatively successful, right? So I looked at the data, and the data isn't really suggesting that, to be fair. Like, high turnovers is the metric, isn't it, of, of uh, where we can win the ball high up the pitch and then basically win chances. That's proven in the game to be very successful, and it often results in goals, and therefore the best teams in the league do that very, very well. What's interesting is that we only have four goals from that the entire the season so far, and teams like City, Arsenal, Liverpool, arguably, you know, or maybe not even arguably, the best teams in the Premier League, they've got double that, right? So it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that the sort of the tactical setup that we're seeing for Pochettino in quite an aggressive system, it <laughs> isn't really working at what, uh, what it needs to, to do, right? So, yeah, like, I think it's very fair to sort of say that the midfield here isn't as balanced as what we thought it was. And, and, and a quick question for you now, mate, is... Obviously, we're hearing lots and lots of rumours about Gallagher potentially leaving the club, and I feel that now it's inevitable, isn't it? Do you think, and this is quite cheeky to say, but do you think, and I have this hypothesis, that they almost didn't quite expect Connor to even be at the club or be as good as he was, and potentially for a Lavia to be included within that three, to then basically give it more balance, basically have the pivot of, you know, uh, Lavia and a Caicedo with an Enzo in front of them, have more of a 4 3 free system. Do you think that's how the sort of the, the transfer guys were dealing with this, uh, this, this sort of squad setup? Yeah, and I still think they are, which is why I think he's going to leave. I don't think they're building towards this like transitional football that Pochettino plays. I think they are like that they did envision Lavia being way bigger part of the squad and Gallagher being a way lesser part of the squad. So now it's obviously tricky because he's been so good, again, in a system that suits him, that he's been so good for us in the sense that now people are going to be against that. But it's, it just doesn't fit the midfield that they're trying to build. They want three very technically secure midfielders. Gallagher's got better on the ball this season, in my opinion, but it's not as good as it can be or as good as it needs to be. And those three, they have a bit more in terms of technical security on the ball and as well just will add more balance if you had Lavia at the six and then Casado and Enzo as the two outside eights, for example. So, yeah, I do think Gallagher wasn't in their initial plans and I still don't think he is, which is why I do think he'll be sold, which is sad to an extent because he's been good, but... Yeah, I think they've built away from him already. Yeah, and, and I do too now. I, th I think everything that we're hearing around the contract situation, around these sort of weird briefings that we're hearing every now and then, the lack of any movement really at all. And, and I mean, this week we're hearing in the press that Gallagher's basically resigned himself to leave and he knows that he's gone. I just feel mm -hmm. the writing is, is on the wall there. So it is interesting, mate. And, and in a weird way, before the season, you know, I was speaking with Joey and, and chatting on the kickoff about our midfield and saying that, you know, those three are actually quality and maybe underrated as a three. And I think as the season's worn on, basically their quality has been sort of, I don't, I wouldn't say fan up, but their quality has been mitigated by the fact that they are so tired and having to play every single game together. And I, and I found basically fatigue has, has really worn down that quality and basically shown some, some uh, sort of danger there. And, and I mm -hmm. agree with you. I do find that we're often being bypassed. And I often find when I'm watching games, like you just watch it, you just go, what's going on? There's so much space in and around the midfield. And that's where there is a lot of pressure coming on to our defence. So let's move on to the defence, right? The first question I've got for you, who do you think is the best centre-back pairing at Chelsea Football Club right now? Injuries aside? Injuries aside. Let's, let's say everyone's 100% fit, which is a big okay. if yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. Because the person I'm going to mention is a massive if, because so, it would mm. be, for me, Wesley Fafana and Levi Colwell. Yeah, and I would I would totally agree with you on that one, mate. And what's interesting is, obviously, The Athletic have done a brilliant article in the last week or so talking about how many players have been available and fit and available for the minutes that they've come in and for the massive £1 billion spent. Basically, we've only had about £250 million worth of that billion pound spent for more than 50% of the season. It's just a damning yeah. stat. It just tells you everything you need to Everyone is sort of beating us around the head with that £1 billion price tag. I mean, you've got to laugh at it at this point because it's just it's just not fair at all so the, the my general point that i think we need to discuss next is bearing in mind we've never actually seen that back two pairing uh play the the sort of you know different uh partnerships every single week we've seen the sassy and Badish Hill, we've seen the sassy and colwell we've seen colwell over the left hand side we've seen tiago next to Badish Hill, tiago next to the sassy i mean i feel like you could almost sort of write a list of every single combination and it would go on for it would go on for like ages right we've seen so many different things do you think that that sort of 
lack of consistency has really hurt us this season in terms of conceding the goals. Yeah, because they're not able to build a connection. Like I think the only time we've sort of seen a connection start to build, and we sort of saw it the other day in a few interviews, I think there was, was that Colwell and Dissassi partnership, and they were speaking about that and the fact that they're sort of getting into, uh, they're building a little bit of a bond, and Colwell was speaking about how Dissassi uh, gets him up and like up for energies and like uh, energizes him in the game basically, and Colwell's been getting into that. So those two are probably the like best example of like actually having a sustained period of time together. But the rest of the season, like you said, we've had so many different pairings. They're not able to connect together. Silver injured, Badi Ashil in and out injured, who's been poor when he's been cutting back. I don't know if that's to do with the injuries or whether he's just struggling to get fully fit and he's been rushed. Or I just think the lack of consistency in a back four doesn't allow for the players to just build that synergy and know where each other's going to be and I think that can lead to a lot of different things in terms of like pulling apart the defence and leaving loads of gaps between not only the defence but also with the midfielders we spoke about just not knowing who's behind you because in one sense if you had a Wesley Fofana who's a lot more aggressive they'll be a lot he'll be a lot closer to those midfield too so if Casado and Enzo did jump out Fofana's would he's the sort of player that would be behind them but then on the flip side of Thiago Silva he would usually sit off a bit deeper due to that lack of athleticism, for example. So you've got different partnerships bringing different things to the table and it's just not clicking altogether as one, is what I would say. Yeah, def- definitely. I-, I just see that consistency and that sort of like um, defensive unit. It was funny, mate. I was watching a City game recently. I can't remember exactly what game it was. A couple of games ago, I think it was in the Premier League. And there was a brilliant drill they did. I don't know if you saw this drill before the game started, where basically there was a defensive four and they were watching and, and moving in a warm up, but sticking very closely together. It was really fascinating to watch. One would come out and press, and you've probably done this in your sort of coaching and your training drills. It's really good to see how a defensive unit can be sort of together and even in a warm-up setting looks so so solid and what i what i tend to see and again this sort of goes into my next point is that as a unit we never seem like we're really sticking together and and i and what i'm worried about is that the defenders per se don't always love defending right and and we've got to move on to the wing backs now as I sort of look at that holistically and you look back in the past, you know, JT and Carvalho would never really be exposed because one, they'd have a brilliant sitter in front of them with a Makaleli or someone, or an Essien of that role, of that calibre. But then you'd also have defenders in the wing back areas that, yes, could bomb up and down and could get assists and goals, but they would always be defenders first, wouldn't they? Do you know what I mean? Like they would be very, very solid. And so... What I've had a look at, and, and we'll put up some stats now on screen about average positions across the last few games, and and I think you tend to see this with quite often with shapes these days that the the, 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 the wing backs will push on and therefore they will be sort of higher up in the average positions, but they always seem very high and wide, and and with a sort of a back four to me it always seems quite open. And I feel like when I'm watching it anecdotally, I always feel like we're going to be cut cut through so what's your sort of stance on that and and do you feel that we are sort of do you think the wing backs don't love defending as much as they should yeah i think we've got some especially with like some chillwell and gusto who i think has been brilliant but i think they are more attack based wingers i think when you have like kukurea is probably more of a defensive fullback than he is an attacking fullback but then in this system he looks like he is told to be aggressive which again he's good at defending on the front foot but a lot of the time with the fullbacks, like you said, they look quite high, but not. it's always both of them, whereas it should only be one. It should be one goes and one stays. But again, I think this is a lack of consistency in the side to know that Gusto, he's the more attacking one, like Kukurea should be sitting. Again, we don't know if Potts wants them to all be aggressive and try and pin them in. But then because we're so disjointed in the press in terms of like who goes and who doesn't, it then ends up that we just get played through and then we've basically got the two defenders at the back because the two midfielders have also pushed up and you've just left with those two centre-backs. So I think, yeah, you could say a lot of them don't really, they aren't defend-first full-backs for a start. I also don't think they've got the physical profile to go forwards and backwards as quickly as they need to because Chilwell's got the legs to do it, but he's not as good defensively. Reese, he's always injured, so like he can do both. But Gusto, we saw in that game against... Oh, can't remember which one it was where he had to get hooked off at the 60th minute because he was just flagging. He was, oh, I think it was Man U. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it was Man U because yeah. he was properly gassed out. So, uh, again, I think with the fullbacks, Potch always likes to get the fullbacks high, but then if you're going to do that, you need the sitters to stay. Whereas I think 
everybody's on different wavelengths right now where he almost everybody's pushing up and there's just nobody other than the two defenders in that rest defence to actually sustain pressure in the other half and just keep us in a tight unit where we need to be. So it's it's tough. It's I I definitely see what you mean with the fullbacks, but I just think I don't know whether to pin that down to a potch thing or a personnel thing just yet. Yeah, I'm I'm the same, mate. And I always struggle. I mean, when I'm watching it, and, and you and I sort of are thinking about this tactically as much as we are just enjoying it as fans. When I'm watching it, I'm thinking, right, what is the tactical solution here? Is it to drop Enzo into a right back position when Gusto p- pushes up? But then you end up sort of having a lot, even more space potentially than created in the middle of midfield, especially if you're pressing high. So I think what Pochettino has got to do is find a sort of a balance here. Like, obviously, we love seeing attacking fullbacks. In fact, we probably made that one of our key sort of tactical innovations in the last sort of 15 years, if you think about it, like we've had always very attacking fullbacks that do like to get in the area. I'm thinking Marcus Alonso. I'm thinking, you know, Chilwell, obviously in more recent times, like even Ivanovic back in the day, mate, Ivanovic would. Victor Moses. Some, yeah. Victor Moses. <laughs> yeah. We've had some barnstorming runs and some great players in the wings. And obviously with the three at the back formation, maybe that's even more exacerbated, but I've just found recently, like it's just far too open and porous. And, and, and I'm glad we covered this first because I feel the middle field and the the wing back sort of combine to make the centre back sometimes look a bit worse and I, I don't think we should and I don't think we are sort of uh, foregoing any blame for the for, uh, for the centre backs but I do think in a young system where they're getting used to each other especially with a, a, a young goalkeeper behind them I often find that we don't do them any favours and, and that's probably one of the worst reasons as a grouping to sort of say why we are Cassini goals and I, I think we basically cracked it with that to be honest with you you know in terms of how we're how we're Cassini goals quick one mate where are you on Petrovic right now do you see this guy as being the sort of the goalkeeper of the future for Chelsea or do you think we end up moving in the market I think that for whether he progresses into something better yeah but I think there's other places in the market we'd probably be better served putting that money first but I can definitely see in the next few years, I think that you could go and make a statement goalkeeper signing as because it's part of the spine. It's like when Alisson joined Liverpool, it's that it invigorates the team. It makes them so much more comfortable knowing who's behind them. So I think that long term, there could be an, a, a debate to bring somebody in that's a bit more world, world class standard, basically. But I'm happy with him for now. Yeah, I really like that you said this point, mate, about coaching, because I think it's actually a really important point generally across our squad right now, because what a lot of people tend to do, and I understand why people do this, is, you know, I'll bring a new player in. If this player isn't good enough, bring another player in and let's let's move in the transfer market and get someone ready right now. And, and there isn't enough sort of focus on coaching. You know, Petrovic yeah. can absolutely get better with his feet. You're, you're so right. You know, we can we can absolutely improve him with that. And I hope they are working on that because, uh, you know, I totally agree. I think there are moments where you watch him and you go, oh, God, yeah, he is a bit nervous with his feet. Or, But also, to, to, on the other side of that coin, sometimes he does just boot it. And I wish Sanchez had done that. You know, there are moments in which we look at the goalkeepers and I'm very happy for a long ball just to go if it mean, if it relieves some pressure. Because, you know, sometimes we do invite that on ourselves. And I, I suppose this is another tactical point that we should just mention. We are being very aggressively told, or the players are, that they should pass out for the back. We have conceded a few goals uh, this season from that. The, the one that really sticks in my mind is that Sanchez ball that he played out to Enzo in the Arsenal game, which Rice then slaps it, uh, you know, in, yeah. into the back of the net. And we, I think that was the equalising goal was it not was that a two no, was that two, the two one two? that was two one that, that was two one there you go yeah, yeah yeah so you know it's it's not uh, that's a bad mistake really ra- really bad mistake and again arguably costs us you know the game there so how how do you feel in the modern game with chelsea with our young players right now with that sort of edicts going out for the manager like are you are you happy for us to persist with that and you take the mistakes or is that something you sort of tweak it's a tough one to speak about because i think it's it comes down to the personnel that you've built because I do think we've, we're built to play this way. We all, we want to lure pressure. We want to play through the phases because we, again, we've bought two hundred million pound midfielders who, by all means, people are on their backs because of their price tags. And yes, hundred million for two mid, like those two midfielders, it is a ridiculous price. But they're brilliant players, and that is what you've bought them in because they're so technically astute that if you can play the type of football where you're playing out from the back, they are two of the best in the league for like actually combining and playing out through that press. Maybe it's not shown as much this season, but I think that's more a structural issue than it is a personnel issue. But then in, on the other hand, if you have Petrovic in goal, 
if you have maybe De Sassi at the back, who sometimes looks a little bit shaky with his feet, sometimes he looks OK. I, I think it d- depends on the game and how he's feeling confident. I think sometimes Kukurea can look a little bit messy on the ball as well at points, chill well. So I think it all depends on the personnel behind them. I think if you get in more comfortable ball-playing defenders or you have Colwell in the team, then I think I'm happy to let that play out and for that to be the sole instruction because I do think it suits more of the players than it doesn't. But I think in the way we've been playing lately without Colwell, think of a disassi Badia shield back line who are they're not being very confident lately anyway and Petrovic in goal. I think at that point you almost disband it to, or at least tweak it to a point where you're more focusing to play out through the fullbacks and you're almost mitigating the central areas until you're in the second phase of build-up, if that makes sense. If I'm, I might be waffling on a bit there. But no, no, it's almost total six. Mi- miss the first phase build-up deep, but bring in them in in the second phase so that there's less chances for error like the Caicedo disassi one yeah. against United or play, like places like that. So you're almost trying to mitigate that. Again, I think it's personnel-based, but... With a young team, you do have to show a little bit of patience and a little bit of understanding as to the situation. But obviously, I do understand as fans, we if it's bringing constant bad results, then you are going to get annoyed. So I get that as well. Is it, That's why it's a tough one to navigate, I think. Yeah. Do you do you think, because I've been thinking about this, mate, a lot and, and looking at the squad right now, obviously what we've done is we've signed quite a few wingers now. And so I can understand why Poch has gone to a four at the back. And actually, we were sort of really needing a four at the back for a long, long time because we've been playing so negatively for, for a while. And obviously, you look at the sort of the goals from last season, obviously, we weren't persistently playing with a five at the back. But again, just go with me here that we weren't we weren't scoring a load of goals. I've had a theory for quite a while that even with the sort of the the winger transfers and that sort of thing we're still potentially a five in the back team how do you how do you sort of see that and if you were manager going into next season how would you set up the team would it be massively different from how we're playing now i can see i think we've still got dna of a five at the back team in that sense but i think that's more so because we don't have the personnel of a back four yet to play a back four i think the center backs for me is a massive point of issue i think without fafana and colwell i think you massively lack the profiles that you need to play the possession football where we want to sustain possession high up the pitch because those defenders need to be able to recover they need to be able to make up big spaces Dezassi, tiago silva even badia shield who sometimes looks a bit lackadaisical when he's making like movements he he, even though he's not slow, he sometimes looks slow just because of his mindset and how he perceives the game. So I think that they could be better protected in a back five just because we don't have that personnel. But I do think the forward, like going forward, I think this team is built for a 4-2-3-1 or at least to, to start in a back four just because I think that it then allows the midfield and it allows you to get the wingers into the isolated positions rather than the wing backs. And I think you can get a little bit more attacking wise out of that. But like I say, I think it's, I keep going back to personnel. I think that's a massive issue. I think if you don't have the right personnel available, then you can't do it. So then what's your plan B? Can you then change or can you then switch it up? Because that's the other thing. Our profiles don't really match what we've done. So you've brought in, you've got Colwell and Fafana who can play that way. And then you've got Badia Shield and Dizassi when they play together. But as a pairing, they both came from Monaco. Don't look like they've played together. No. For me, no. They, no. Like, Monaco conceded a lot of goals with those yeah. two as they're set about pairing. A lot of goals. Yeah, and I, I just think Dezassi's he's a lot more erratic and he he wants to be aggressive, which again is fine, I think, in the way we play. But then pairing with somebody else who's going to back it up, like like Colwell was, but then with Badia Shiel, he's a bit more reserved, and it just they, they pull each other apart, and it ends up with a massive gap to be exploited. I just, I think you've got to be really careful when you're picking these back fours that. The people, everybody's on the same page, like you said about in the with the warm ups. Everybody has to be. It's a stru- It's a unit of four. It's not individuals. They need to know what the other three are doing in the back of their mind when one of them steps. It's very yeah. important. So, yeah. yeah. Do you not think that basically the profile of Co- of um, Colwell and the profile of Fafana in an inside left and an inside right position, bringing the ball forward, move actually dribbling, but then also passing. Like I, everything you said there makes complete sense and I can totally see them in a back four together but as I'm thinking about this even now on this call now I'm sort of going do you know what in a weird way if you put like a Thiago Silva-esque player in the middle of those and obviously Thiago's going but someone as imperious as him and as cool on the ball I think that in a weird way like a Conte system they would almost be like your dream centre-backs if you think about it yeah 
I, I've again in some of the like coaching like um, different manager idea videos that I've made. Like I did an Inzaghi on a little while ago, and that, with his like how it would work for Chelsea with Inzaghi, for example, and that's how I sort of said it with like Colwell and Fafana. They drive the ball forward as the Inter Milan centre backs do, and they step up and they actually use their carrying to get you out. I think then the issue becomes with the full backs. I think then you'd have to go and get Reese like Gusto as a right wing back for me is perfect because he does have the qualities to attack and sort of like he almost can move like a winger. He has like got a good enough ball carrying and good enough on the ball crossing at all these scenarios. I think you'd need to replicate that on the left. I think Chilwell isn't as good of a dribbler and like making space for himself. He's good at running in behind and crossing, but I think he needs to carve the like cross for himself. Cucurella is not that left wing back type. Again, Matson would have been perfect, but what's happened with him? He's got a release clause. He's going to be going. So, yeah. I think, again, back three, I could, I definitely see it. I definitely hear that because I do. I actually think Cole will probably would look best in a fluid back three system. But again, then it comes down to you getting the best out of the back three. But are you getting the best out of the wing backs? Are you going to get the best out of so like maybe a Mudrick? Could he? Could you change him into a left wing back and get that out of him? Like Amarim's done it with one of his wingers at Sporting, Jene. He's made him into a wing back and it's worked really well. But can you do that with our personnel, Madrid, Madueke? It's it's all it all comes down to coaching at the end of the day. <laughs> so Yeah, it does. What can it you does. Do with the squad? And, and- and, and do you know what's interesting is I think both those examples, Mudrik and Madueke, I think their defensive output is probably their weakest, both in both cases, some their weakest part of their entire game. So is it, it is going to be more difficult to convert a player like that. The five of the back system isn't necessarily something that Chelsea fans are rushing to get back to because it was such a defensive sort of system. Let's talk about the manager very, very briefly here. I, fa- I found some of his movement in games to be so slow and so negative. And I think this is probably one of the biggest things you do beat uh, Pochettino over the head with it when you're sort of questioning his ability to continue with the the sort of squad movement going forward. The subs are so bad, aren't they, mate? I found so many moments in games where he could lock down um, sort of results and he hasn't brought on a Thiago Silva who's ended up staying on the bench or we haven't loaded the box with some defenders. I think... Back in the day, and I'm sure you agree with this, back in the day, we've had managers that would come in and close off games. I just don't think we're doing that at the moment, are we? No, and I think that as well comes down to the person on the bench. The silver one's the big one, because I do think in games you could have easily gone to a back five, put silver in the middle, and instantly you have a bit of stability, but also you have a bit of know-how on the pitch. It's, it brings experience, a cool head to a very erratic group of players, especially if we've just conceded a goal. So it does bring him and a bit of calmness to the team because even, apparently even the players were asking for him to be included. So they even feel that just his presence on the pitch brings that leadership and that just gives him a bit of confidence in the team in terms of from the back outward. So Silver's the big one. I think from the bench in terms of midfield, I think that's another thing that's really hurt us not having an extra body like a Lavia or somebody just to come on who can bring that defensive capability. I think Gallagher points under Potter I was saying this he was coming off the bench uh, and closing out games from the bench he was coming on about 60th minute and he was fresh and he was just ch- ch- harrying the ball down I did an article about this last year and saying that he was our like John Obi Mikel a lot of people didn't like that comparison it was obviously a very tongue-in-cheek but it was more yeah, so the yeah. fact that he comes off the bench and he he's there to do a job he's there to do a half an hour stint where he is actually essentially protecting a result for us, maybe more on the front foot, but he's still, that is his job. And I think this season we've lacked having a someone like that from the bench because Gallagher's starting. So without a Lavia or without Santos, who's out on loan, obviously he had Or Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Even Uga Chukwu, like he's got the, he's got the height and the sort of the, the sort of physical ability to close down games, doesn't he? I think yeah. we've really lacked that, haven't we really to bring on a, a big tall player that can win headers because basically what ends up happening with the in these games is balls get whipped into the box we basically if you think about it we often do just look, uh, miss a knockdown or also just miss a header and, and i feel that's basically the biggest error at the moment especially when we're facing teams at the bottom half of the league where we just can't close down these games i feel that's the the biggest error really yeah i agree it's like the sheffield one as well with the headers the that was the headers at sheffield i think not burnley where the second goal where we missed yeah. about four headers consecutively. And again, yeah, you, if you have a presence in there that puts himself and wins that ball, that never happens. But you can't you can't chain mistakes like that because if you start chaining mistakes, that's when bad things happen. The odd mistake, can you can get away with it. 
But if you're in a sequence of play and two or three mistakes happen in one sequence, it's never going to end well. No, it's not. It's not. And and look, I think it's always important to give both sides this. I feel in this video so far, what we've done is we've sort of like pointed out some of the tactical sort of um, mistakes, basically, that I feel and you feel that Pochettino has made this season and basically ended up with us conceding the amount of goals that we've done. But to be fair to him, those tactical changes have resulted in more goals being scored. So you can, there's always pros and cons to this. Before we get on to sort of talking more about the injuries and, and talking about how we can potentially improve, what I just want to say to everyone is, Connor's got an absolutely unbelievable channel here. You see the wealth of experience he's got. So if you haven't already, ch uh, check the link in the description. Connor's channel will be down there. So go and check that out. Please do. He's got an absolutely unbelievable channel. And we're so lucky to have him on my channel here today. So thank you again, Connor. Let's quickly talk about the injuries first. I think that's a very important point to make here in that we've already discussed it very briefly. But obviously, because we haven't had any consistency throughout the team, or actually, if you think about it, the best players, we haven't really been able to sort of field that starting eleven that we do feel is going to be more defensively sound. As you go into next season, do you feel that with these players coming back, next season's scoring rate should be less than it, it is now? Like, sh surely that's the way it's going to go, right? You would think so, <clears throat> in the sense of Fafana coming back and actually being able to back up that sort of aggressive, more aggressive press, like I said earlier, like that having a centre-back that is actually suited to playing that way rather than the slower or more reserved types that we've had. I don't think it completely mitigates the issue because I do think that one of the biggest issues, I'm not sure if I've even mentioned it in this video, is the, temp the lack of tempo being able to slow it down. I think a lot of the time, because we're always playing at such a high speed game and we're always trying to look to make these end-to-end -end basketball type games you don't allow the team to almost get into a set structure so it's always very erratic back and forth whereas if you slow the game down in the middle of the pitch you then have more bodies around the ball to then actually counter press if you do lose the ball which i don't think we do enough we often see enzo a lot earlier in the season pushing up and making that three one six so then essentially if you lose the ball you've already got only four players behind you've not got a usual five or at least players to recover enzo's not athletic enough to make up the ground and it brings mistakes. So I don't think it's the sole issue, those injuries, but I do think if you're looking at it from a perspective of does Reese James coming back into the side make us more defensively sound? Yes. Does Wesley Fofana coming back into the side make us look more defensively sound? Yes, I think so. So if you take it as simply as that, I think you have to at least give some credit in the sense of probably does minimise the goals at least a, li at least a bit. Yeah, yeah. And even with the midfielders as well, you know, bringing in Uga Chukwu or Lavia or even Santos, been imperious, been so good in France. I mean, probably won't see him next season, but that's such a shame because I, I really do like that player. And I hope, I hope he does have a really long future at Chelsea because he just looks brilliant. There's so many of these, good. yeah, so many of these players that you just look at under 20 level have just been bossing it. Um, and, and I hope that Casade and Santos will be given the chance at the football club because I feel that they've earned it. And they're not the yeah. finished articles now, but but hopefully they will be. Mate, the question I think we've kind of we we've kind of given the problems, but we've also have given the solutions here, in that we feel that there should be a bit more defensive solidities. We feel that the wing back should be more defensively sound. We feel that there should be some partnerships building with uh, solid players that are injury free, hopefully going into next season. We should be um, potentially pressing slightly less because that isn't necessarily being that productive. But also we should be sort of looking at the personnel in the midfield to also help the defenders. There's so many different things that we've said uh, that we can change. The question that I've got for you, because you are, again, an expert in terms of these transfers, is if you were going to sign someone in the sense of that positioning, uh, bearing in mind that Badishil has been so poor. For Fana, again, we've got no idea how good he's going to be better, uh, you know, when he comes back off the injury. Who would you sign? Like, who are you looking at? Because I feel that you've got a guy that could come in straight away and be pretty good, right? <laughs> I've got the, I've got my choice. A lot of people may disagree, but for me, it's Usman Diamande from Sporting. Watched a lot of Sporting this year, doing stuff on Amarim, doing stuff on... Every, and I did a piece on him last year, so I've, I've been watching him for a while now. I think he brings a lot of the qualities that we lack, if especially if we're going to stay with Poch next season, even more so, I think. Because, you, like I said earlier, you need those aggressive-minded centre-backs who can actually win their 1v1 duels. 
I always refer to it, and this is bad because he made a really bad mistake yesterday, but Van de Ven for Tottenham, he was signed because they needed a groundy and defender who was going to cover in transition. I think we lack that without Fafana. So I think bringing in someone like Diamande, it almost mitigates that. And if Fafana doesn't get fully fit or we don't, don't see the best out of him as he is getting fully fit, Diamande brings a similar skill set that we need, that physicality. He's good on the ball. He's he's quick and just brings that defensive solidity in terms of defending transitions, which Poch's football does open us up to. We are going to be defending transitions. That is what will happen under Pochettino. That is no um, like myth. That will just happen. So he my, would be my choice. I hear that he's been playing in the back three. Some people's excuses... And the fact that he is also young. So, again, if we're, we all keep saying about we need experience, but then the signings being touted or being even suggested aren't experienced. So, again, I, you can, I can hear the arguments for that. But I do think that he brings the exact skill set of centre-back that you need for this back four to flourish in the way it would. So I think, yeah, Diamande would be the one for me. And then you've almost, you can sort of pair him with Colwell, and then, or if Fafana comes back, you've got you've got options basically. But he would be my most complete choice, I think. Yeah, yeah, I like I like that a lot. And obviously, we've heard loads of rumours about sort of centre back options. I know you've also talked about T- Tadebo. I think he's yeah. also quite expensive and potentially going elsewhere. Is it is it Man United that is the biggest rumour, or is there someone else that's in in for him? Yeah, I think it's Manu that Manu and us were the two ones that were getting rumoured. I think that was January, even as soon as as early as that, uh, that we were getting rumoured to go for him as well. I think Manu's yeah. good chance they go for him as well. But again, he's probably the secondary choice for me behind Diamande because he brings again a similar skill set, and he's a couple of years older. So if you want to bring that into account, he, he's not old. He's twenty four, so it's not exactly experienced. No. But no. for our squad, that's quite experienced. <laughs> So, Literally, that's the yeah. state of affairs that we're in right now. Exactly. A twenty-four-year-old that- would probably be our third oldest player. Yeah, yeah exactly. Especially, How do yeah, you feel Silver about Guehi? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Silver's well, but Silver's gone, isn't it? He's he's absolutely gone. How do you yeah. feel about Guehi, mate? You know, at Palace, do you do you think we'd potentially entertain him coming back to the football club? I rate him. I don't think yeah. he's the right choice in a back far uh, in a back four. I think if you were going to bring him in, like you said earlier, I could definitely see him working in a back five. Not for me in a back four. I don't think he brings enough of the physical attributes that you need or that we need for the way we're playing. I think he's good on the ball. He's obviously a bit smaller, but he still makes it work. He is still he'd like the notion that he's small isn't enough because he does still win aerial duels and he does still put himself about. He's he is physical in that sense. But I just think in terms of recovery speed and things like that, you can go for different players that fit more. And I think, yeah, in a back five, if we was going to transition to that back five that we spoke about, maybe I'd look that way. Back two or back four, but him in the back two centre-backs, probably not for me. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair enough. And, and I, I always feel a little bit the same with some of these players that we've cast off in the past. You know, I like the idea of bringing them back. There's something nostalgic about bringing them back. And sometimes that nostalgia does sort of cloud the overall data and the, the yeah. sort of the judgment of the player. I think he's going to be an exceptional player. I think he's going to be a really good, you know, out and out sense back. And I think he will play for England in the future. And maybe that's the biggest indictment, you know, of our sort of transfer policy that we've let an England potential future in- international go. But um, I understand why there are better options. Mate, I'm going to throw one. At... Go on, go on. I was just going to say with the Gurhi one, I did actually say this when we sold him after he came back off that loan from Swansea. I didn't want him to be sold. For that 20 million to palace in the first place so i thought he was yeah. good enough to play so that again that just says it all i think when before you sell them there's chances that they could do it and tamori and all these players that we've sold they could have been good enough but i think to then bring them back at inflated costs i think that is just again compounding mistakes it just shows it just shows the chance of failure more than anything doesn't yeah. it and, and it is a bit of a shame that we don't really include buyback clauses i mean city have this brilliant ability to include buyback clauses so in almost every outgoing transfer it seems like and and we're just really bad at doing that i understand why because it, it helps with the transfer but yeah not good mate yeah. humor me for one second right i uh i want you to sort of put your judge hat on almost like we're in the x factor right now i'm going to throw a name at you and uh and you have to tell me how you feel about this what i did mate is i had a look at some free agents because as we uh, as we know ffp is an issue um today we've sold we found out uh, that we've sold a hotel just to offload some of the uh, the ffp concerns which tells you everything Good you need sale. to know 
about yeah yeah exactly we might not need to sell gallagher now because we sold a hotel for 70 million but i had a look at the options and a name sprung out to me a, a controversial name i think a, a, a name a guy that's had a bit of a uh, checkered past and also a bit of a weird career path I, I actually looked at the teams he played for and i sort of forgot that he played for a few of these teams but it's axel witzel i think he's i think he's 33 34 35 potentially He's played 25 uh, games in the Liga this season, 92% pass actually, no errors, which quite frankly for our centre-backs and goalkeepers at the moment, that's, uh, that's a very good state of affairs to have no errors leading to goals. And then also 4.5 recoveries per game. This guy I felt was a C- um, CDM. He's obviously, as he's gone back in his career, he's gone, he's gone backwards. Do you feel that playing a more experienced play out in the back with Thiago Silva going out could be a potential route for us to go and is Axel Witzel the kind of guy that you'd see working in a system under Poch again I think similarly to Gerhi I think you need to protect a player like him in a back three I think if he was playing as a central centre back in a back three and you allow him because like you said as well he was a CDM that is where he played so if you let him be that central centre back and he's allowed to step up and win the ball and if he does step up you've got faster and better recovery defenders behind him I think that worked perfectly. I think that'd be really good. He's very astute on the ball. He's experienced. So yeah, I've also looked at these options, not Vitzel personally, but like I've tried to look for experience and to see where you could dot it into the team because I do think it's important to note that experience is needed in this side one way or another. I don't yeah. really mind where, but I think it does need a little bit of injection into this team. So I have also looked at the options that you could bring in there. And I don't think there's too many that fit. So I guess if you was going to go to a back five, Vitzel's not a terrible shout in terms of he's a free agent and he is astute on the ball. He's good. But I don't think he probably wouldn't be a potch player is my only thing. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I understand one. it. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was a bit rogue and I'm glad you <laughs> called me out for it. But I also thought a potential um, defensive midfield option to bolster this sort of like area of the pitch. We don't, like we say we've got a lot of midfielders, but don't have a lot of anchor men. Do you know what I mean? We don't have yeah. a lot of guys that are the sort of holding four, as I like to call them. So, yeah, it, it, that was one that I saw in the free agent list. And I actually went, do you know what? If I was uh, doing this on Football Manager, that's kind of the <laughs> guy that I'd go for. And, and as we know, Football Manager is all based on the game. You know, Pochettino's playing it in his spare time. But yeah, I thought that was a, I thought that was a really interesting one. But yeah, I love Diamande at, at Sporting. And I think, I think that would be a very exciting one. Summer is going to be mad for these defensive reinforcements. I do think we're potentially going to get another centre back. I think they are also apparently looking at left back as well, which is a yeah. which is a very interesting one with Cucurella potentially being the one that's then offloaded. It's going to be a big summer for our defence, and I do I don't think we can really go into next season and have the same errors that we do this season so yeah mate look i've, I've really really enjoyed this chat and, and thanks so much for going through it. i feel like we basically have sold the, the defensive crisis that we have at chelsea football club and i'm sure they're watching right now and they want to hear all about it but yeah if um we'll leave it there but if a- anyone isn't yet subscribed to connor make sure you click the link in the description go and subscribe to his channel unbelievably insightful tactical analysis and all round brilliant chap so again mate thank you so much for coming on and we will both see you very soon for another one of these tactical videos let us know in the comments what you'd like us to talk about and also let us know how you would solve the defensive crisis we'll talk to you soon thank you very much